Yeah, and uh, I've gotten all of the uh, uh, submission ones in, so I'm going to post my comments to Fonter after this lecture, so that I'm going straight up to the office afterwards and starting to post those to, uh, to it, and it's been very good. Uh, most of you have uh, just basics uh, on, on the comments, so, so it's uh, mistakes that even uh, very experienced engineers sometimes do, so it's... Uh, it's not really a, a huge problem, so I think this uh, bodes well for the, the rest of the submissions. So I think it's going to be uh, very good. Uh, yeah, we have hydraulic systems today. And of course we have learning goals, as we usually do. We are going to get to know how a double acting cylinder works. So last week we looked at a single acting cylinder, one that can only push one way and is reliant on external forces to push it back. The double acting ones can, uh, can use hydraulic pressure to move both ways. So we're going to learn about those. We're going to become familiar with different types of double acting cylinders. So that there are actually quite a lot of different types of them. So we're going to look at those. We're going to know how end position cushioning works, which basically means that if you are uh, extending your piston, you don't want it to just slam into the end of it because whatever you have connected to the other end of your piston rod is going to get a jerk then. So you want it to just slowly stop as it gets to the end. You don't want it to just continue in the same velocity until it hits, hits bottom. We're going to become familiar with different types of seals, so how they are uh, creating the seals around the piston so that you don't have hydraulic fluid escaping from one side of the piston to the other when you're uh, pushing it, and also how you avoid, uh, how you seal it from not having a leak to the out, outside environment. We're going to become familiar with different mounting options. There's quite a lot of different ways of how you can mount cylinders, so we're going to look at uh, the few most common of them. We're going to know how to bleed off air in a hydraulic system because that's something we don't want. We don't want bubbles of air trapped inside our hydraulic fluid, because then as, as we are putting pressure inside of this, the air is going to be compressed, and then we are suddenly going to get, uh, especially if you are extending a, a cylinder uh, and you have air bubbles trapped inside it, you are going to get sort of, uh, uh, you're going to not going to get a smooth motion as it's extending. And often that is the case, you really want a smooth motion from your hydraulic system. And then you don't want to have these air bubbles inside it. That's going to, uh, to uh, create problems. We're going to become familiar with different characteristic data for, uh, for the uh, uh, double acting cylinders. And we're going to get to know how to dimension a cylinder with regards to resistance against buckling. Or maybe you remember buckling from uh, statics and strength of materials. If you have, if you have a long rod of something and you put pressure on both ends, sooner or later if the, you increase the pressure it's going to buckle so it's going to bend the entire entire rod so that that's something that can happen if you have uh, if you haven't dimensioned your rod to be thick enough and strong enough so we're going to look at that how we how we uh, transfer the resistance against buckling used on the metallic rods in statics and strength of materials how we transfer this to to a moving cylinder basically So then we have double acting cylinders. We're going to start off with that. And opposite from, uh, from the single acting ones, here we have uh, the possibility of pressurizing both sides of the piston with hydraulic fluid. Which means that we can perform work in both directions. Uh, often, we are going to look a bit more into this, but often we can't perform the same amount of work in both directions. That has uh, a bit to do with uh, the available area for the hydraulic fluid on each side of the piston, because usually on one side of the piston, you also have a piston rod, which is sort of stealing some of the area from the, uh, from the piston surface, so that the hydraulic fluid uh, won't get any contact with that. And here we have a typical double acting cylinder. So we have uh, the uh, entrance port here for letting hydraulic fluid in. This is the piston area. Here we have an exit port so that if we put pressure in here, the hydraulic fluid that is filling up this area can exit through 
through this port and enter through the return line and into the tank. And then you can switch it around and you can put pressure through here and then you will have uh, hydraulic fluid escaping through this port and back to the, back to the tank. Yeah? Yeah, we are going to go, uh, we're going to put names on all of these numbers, so we are going to go more into detail. This was just a, a quick, quick one. So we start off with uh, the cylinder itself is basically just a pipe that's been machined, uh, which means that we need to close it off in both ends. So at the bottom, we can just have a cylinder bottom. So that's just a, uh, a plate that fits into the, into the cylinder that is uh, put into place there. Uh, it is often, uh, so sometimes it has uh, very uh, coarse threads in this area so that you, you screw the entire bottom in. Uh, it depends a bit on how much pressure you have in here because if the pressure gets large enough you can just rip the threads off. Some of them actually have a flange going on the outside here so that they are screwed in with bolts into the bottom of the cylinder. It depends a bit uh, on design. But you will always have this cylinder bottom which is designed to, to handle all of the, all of the uh, maximum operating pressure that you can get inside the cylinder. Then we have a vent screw, which we will see later on. It's uh, connected to bleeding off excess air in the system. And we also have the piston itself, which separates the two sides uh, with regards to the hydraulic fluid. You can also see the, the black spots here. We'll uh, talk about them down here, but those are the seals uh, that are making sure that the, when you have pressurized hydraulic fluid on this side, it's not going to just go past and leak past the piston and over to the other side. Here we have the uh, piston rod chamber and the piston rod itself, which is the one we have to dimension against buckling if, uh, if we have Particularly if you have a very long cylinder, like one, uh, the one we uh, saw a, a picture of uh, last week, where you had a guy far off there, and you had this really long, huge cylinder. So particularly when you have, uh, have uh, long cylinders like that, that one was really massive, so I don't think buckling would be a problem with it. It depends on how much load it was getting. Then you have what's called the cylinder barrel, which is basically just a pipe that's been put through uh, both milling machines and, uh, and uh, lathes. And here you have a piston rod guide, which is meant to, to make sure that the piston rod is going to move exactly along the center line of the axis of the cylinder. So, so it's uh, guiding the rod and keeping it in position so that it doesn't flip over to one side or anything. And of course, the piston is going to move through here, so we're going to need a seal inside in order to make sure that when we are pulling the cylinder back, uh, putting pressure inside the piston rod chamber, we don't want that pressure to escape along the, along the piston rod and to the outside. Then we have the end cap, which basically serves the same purpose as the cylinder bottom in uh, making sure that it's keeping everything inside. So it's basically a lid that's put on. But of course, the end cap needs to have a hole in it that fits the uh, piston rod because the piston rod is going to be moving outwards here. And as you can see, you have quite a lot more thickness in this case in the cylinder bottom than you have on the end cap itself. But that's also because the piston rod guide is helping to take some of the, uh, some of the uh, strength here. So the end cap itself doesn't need to be all that strong. And then we have the wiper, which we've looked at a bit earlier, which is basically just a, a sort of uh, rubber or plastic uh, ring, uh, which often has a, um, let's just do a drawing on the side here. So if you have the piston rod, it often ha is uh, shaped in such a way that it's going to have a lip that's resting on the, uh, along the entire circumference of the of the rod so that if you have particles and debris here, it's going to hit this one and go off to the side <coughs> instead of following the piston rod into the cylinder. Because if you get, if you get a, uh, a grain of sand or something, which can be quite sharp, if you get that one past the wiper, 
then it's going to hit the seal afterwards, and the seal is going to just be ripped up by, by the uh, grain of sand. The grain of sand is going to end up in here, so you're going to have contamination in your uh, hydraulic fluid, which probably is going to be caught by the filter, but you still have a damage on your seal. So you have a damaged portion of your seal, so most likely sooner or later now, and then it's going to start dripping uh, hydraulic oil from, from the cylinder. And the piston seals, I mentioned those a bit earlier also, but uh, those are meant for uh, handling all of the pressure difference from each side. Because basically when, when you're pressurizing one side of the piston, the other side will be open all the way back to the tank. So it will basically just have the pressure of the atmosphere that's in the tank. It will, of course, get some resistance because there will be resistance getting through this port. So it's going to be uh, restricting the flow a bit through all of the lines going and all of the valves and back into the tank. That's, of course, going to create some resistance. So you're going to get a slight, uh, uh, slightly higher pressure than, than the atmospheric pressure in the tank. But you're still going to get... Often you will uh, uh, hit it with 200 bars or something on this side, and then you will get maybe four or five bars of uh, resistance on this side. So it's going to be quite a lot of pressure difference from one side of the piston to the other. That is also one of the reasons why uh, there are often two seals. So you have one seal that is sealing it from this side, and then you have one seal, this one, that is sealing it from this side. So it uh, depends where you have your pressure. And these seals are shaped so that they're going to be deformed. When we have pressure coming in on this side, it's going to deform the uh, seal a bit so that it's going to be basically squashed in into the, uh, the uh, ring inside the piston here and also against the cylinder barrel so that it's going to be, uh, be creating a tight seal there. <coughs> And they are, uh, they are most easily deformed from one direction, which is why they are using two seals. So they have one seal facing this way and one seal facing that way, so that it's going to be, be get the correct, uh, uh, correct deformation from the pressure. And then we have the piston chamber, which is basically just uh, the opposite of the piston rod chamber. So it's just uh, opposite sides of the piston itself. And this is a regular double-acting cylinder, and those are usually shown by that symbol, which is basically a, a very crude drawing of a cylinder. And when we are using this one, we get hydraulic pressure, which will pressurize the piston chamber in uh, point 12 here. And then, of course, the surface of the piston itself here will receive a lot of pressure. And you know that if you have pressure, and you multiply it with an area, a surface, then you're going to get a force. Which means that you're going to get a force that's pushing on the uh, piston here, and the piston and the piston rod, both this one and the piston rod, they will move uh, outwards, so they will advance. And all of the hydraulic fluid here in the uh, piston rod chamber is going to be, be sent back into the return line and back into the tank. And then when you want the uh, reverse to happen, you want to uh, retract the uh, piston rod, you put the pressure into the piston rod chamber instead. So now we have to remember the, the piston has been moved all the way over here. And then we put the pressure in here, and everything is going to go backwards. And again, you have this note with, in this case, you have a smaller surface area than on this side because of the piston rod that's in the way. <coughs> and then the piston and the piston rod will return back into this position. And as they are returning, all of the hydraulic fluid, and fluid that we previously injected into this piston chamber, it's going to be sent back into the tank. And again, we have the, a force, which is the same as pressure times area. And when we are advancing the cylinder or the piston rod, then the area is, of course, all of the area here on this side. 
It might look, uh, I'm going to move the back one, it might look a bit like we have less area here also because of this part here. Uh, but this one is going to, uh, to separate from either it's a part of the piston itself, so either it's connected to the piston and it's going to be separated from the cylinder bottom when, as soon as the piston starts moving, or it's connected to the cylinder bottom and it's just uh, what the piston stops against when it gets to the, the end of the road. And the reason it is there is basically just so that we have some room uh, to start filling fluid into it. Because if, if the piston went all the way into the cylinder bottom, then this port would just start uh, pushing fluid against, uh, basically against the side of the piston and the seal. That wouldn't have any effect. So we need to have a small area here which makes some room. The same happens on this side. Once we have advanced it fully, it's going to stop along, along the edge of the piston rod guide. And then we have this small area which goes all the way around the circumference of the cylinder in order to let... Uh, let fluid uh, enter and uh, start, start pushing on the uh, piston surface. So here, the, when we are advancing it, we get the area, which is just the area of the entire uh, piston. Usually, you simplify it and use the, uh, the cylinder diameter, uh, because even though, even though the piston is going to be slightly smaller, than the, uh, the cylinder, the, uh, the small part of hydraulic fluid that passes between the cylinder and the piston is still going to hit the seal, and then it's going to push on the seal instead. So basically you have the entire area that's inside the cylinder to, to uh, push against. And then when you're pulling it back, you get the same uh, calculation, only now you have to subtract the uh, diameter or the surface area of the of the uh, piston rod. So you get the. I think we'll do it um, like this. So you'll get the um, full. You'll get the full area of the piston when you are pushing it outwards. But then when you're retracting it, you need to you need to remove the central area where the piston rod is, which means that you have less less area available for for your hydraulic fluid to press against. And that's going to affect that's of course going to affect how much force you're going to get uh, when you are pulling it back. <coughs> So, in the uh, double acting cylinders, we have the piston surface here, and the piston ring surface, so often called, and the piston chamber in here. Um, you're basically going to see, no matter what textbook you're looking in, uh, these different parts, they're usually going to have some sort of variation on these names. So, another textbook might not call it the piston ring surface, it might call it... Uh, piston rod side uh, or something. It's uh, a lot of different names that are being used for these, but uh, they're, usually, they're usually just uh, different variants of, of the same name. So they're not, uh, it's not like it's a completely new name, so it's impossible to guess what it is. So when we are advancing the cylinder, the hydraulic fluid on the piston rod side, it has to be displaced into the return line. So then we, we are advancing it, we are pushing hydraulic fluid in here, and we get return on this side. Which means that the cylinder will provide force when it's advancing. And it's going to provide more force than when it's returning. As we have already talked about, due to the difference in the area. And again, when it's returning, you get pressure in on this side, and you're forcing pressure out uh, in the... Uh, in the piston chamber instead, for forcing the fluid out of the piston chamber. And <clears throat> this also means that the cylinder has a greater operating speed when it's returning than when it's advancing. Because then we have suddenly a difference in volume for the fluids. Because the volume here 
is greater than the volume here because here we have the piston rod that's in the way it's sort of uh, stealing uh, parts of our volume, which means that we need less fluid on this side in order to move the piston all the way back. And since we are running the same pump, we're not, uh, we're not uh, making a pump go slower when we are pulling the cylinder back, so the pump is delivering the same flow, it's going to need less, uh, less fluid, and since our flow is usually given in liters per minute, so it's going to use, it needs less liters, which is going to translate into fewer minutes or seconds to, to be pushed back. So it has a greater speed when it's moving back. So although it has less force, it has a greater speed. <coughs> and now we have a clip on uh, how they make hydraulic cylinders. When the pressure is on, that's when a lot of machines really perform. We're talking about the kind of pressure that comes from hydraulic fluid as it's pumped through cylinders. From crane claws to snow plows to a lot of manufacturing equipment, Hydraulic cylinders are truly a driving force in the world. This is fluid power in action. Pressurized fluid pumped into cylinders does all the heavy work, making this forklift actually lift. Production begins with the cylinder barrel. A bandsaw cuts steel tubing to the correct length. Then, computerized tools carve a solid cylinder to transform it into the piston rod. It's this rod that will be moved by hydraulic pressure to transfer force to a machine like the forklift. The tools cut threads in one end and also carve various diameters. This will have a cushioning effect as the machine the cylinder powers cycles down. The other end of the rod will be attached to the piston which is now taking shape as a special tool bores through the center to create a threaded hole. Using a special gauge, a worker me measures the hole's dimensions to confirm the piston rod will fit into it exactly. Another computerized cutter then carves grooves on the outside wall of the piston. With the piston now complete, they install a web of sealer rings on both it and the cylinder head which has been machined in a similar fashion. These sealers will prevent leaking of the pressurized fluids as the piston rod moves through the center holes of these parts. This blue sealer will also act as a wiper, removing dirt from the piston rod and keeping contaminants out of the cylinder. This O-ring installed on the outside of the cylinder head will stop fluid leakage between it and the cylinder barrel. With the sealers installed, a worker now lubricates the mouth of the cylinder head. This allows for a smooth installation of the part to one end of the piston rod. He then slides the piston onto the other end of the rod and secures it with a nut. He tightens the nut to the rod using an impact gun. Production now returns to the cylinder barrel as a robot welds a cap onto it. The open fitting adjacent to it was installed earlier to attach the hose that delivers the fluids. The worker now clamps the cylinder barrel in a device to stabilize it. He lubricates the threaded open end so he can easily slide a metal sleeve into it. This sleeve prevents snags, so those critical sealer rings remain intact as he now inserts the piston rod assembly into the barrel. Once the piston is safely in the barrel, he removes the sleeve. He then shoves the rod further into the barrel and screws the cylinder head to the threaded lip. Using a spanner wrench, he tightens the assembly to the required torque. He dabs adhesive onto a screw and inserts the screw in the cylinder head. The adhesive dries and expands to lock the screw tightly in place. They now etch the client name, part number, and other information onto the assembled cylinder using a computerized engraving tool. 
This cylinder is now ready for fluid, hydraulic grade oil specially formulated to operate under pressure. The technician attaches hoses to the cylinder to fill it with pressurized oil. As the pressure builds at one end, the piston rod extends. He then supplies fluid to the other end and the rod retracts. He runs a finger around the fittings and sealers to check for leaks. He gives this hydraulic cylinder the all clear. After a good wash, a worker spray paints the hydraulic cylinders to protect the metal against rust. Now complete, these hydraulic cylinders are ready to leave the factory. They'll soon be under a lot of pressure to keep machines and mechanisms operating, but it's the kind of pressure they've been made for. So it's quite interesting to see how they, they actually do all of the, the machining and stuff. So it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty awesome how small tolerances they have on this. Uh, you could see the, the, the guy was actually having a bit of a problem getting it onto the piston rod when he was, was pushing that uh, top of the cylinder on there. So it's, uh, it's really fine, fine tolerances when they're working on them. So now we're going to look at uh, different kinds of double acting cylinders. And this is basically the one we've already been looking at, uh, a cutaway view of it. And it's uh, called a differential cylinder. And it's called that because it has a different surface area on each side of the piston. And in this case, as you can see, they are showing it as a 2 to 1 ratio, which means that the surface area on the piston side is twice as large as the area on the piston rod side. was actually given there also. So, and this also means that uh, the piston will return twice as fast uh, than advancing. So if you get it moving out at, uh, at a certain speed, it's going to return twice as fast when, when you're putting it in. So something you have to think about when you are designing systems is uh, can you allow for it to move that fast uh, back or do you have to try to, uh, try to figure out some way of um, of cancelling this uh, difference in speed. Yeah? Uh, usually moving fast isn't a problem when you're retracting it. Because like on, on a, uh, for example, you saw, saw the example with the forklift there. Uh, it actually, it usually has a load on when it's pulling it back. So the load is going to put some pressure on it and that's going to slow it down. So it's not going to go, go all that fast when it's pulling back. Uh, and <coughs> That is usually how you would uh, figure out the way of putting it. You have to think about the force you're going to get when it's advancing compared to the force when it's uh, retracting. And you also have to think about the speeds they are going to be moving in. And by doing that, you can actually figure out which way are you going to put in your cylinder. Because if you need the force from this side, uh, you really need that one to push something. But it doesn't really matter if it's going quickly uh, back. You're, you're just going to push something and you're not going to have any load on it when it's going back, so it's not going to matter. Then you can just use it in this direction and it's going to push. But if it's supposed to go in, in the other direction, you actually need some speed when you're going to pull it, but you don't need all that much force. Then it might actually be better to use it as a pulling motion so that you pull it instead because uh, then you will have the cylinder here, you will extend it, you will connect it to whatever it is you're going to move, and then you pull it back. So that, then you will get uh, the advantage of the speed, but you won't get as much force for it. So it's uh, all about thinking about which way are you going to use the system when you're using it, especially with the, with the differential cylinders. And we've already looked at the, the symbol for the differential cylinders, but we have quite a lot more different kinds of cylinders. You have these ones, and as you can see, it says here that the area on one side is equal to the area on the other side. And that is just basically because they've extended the piston rod to go uh, on both sides of the, of the cylinder. And that's called a steady speed cylinder because that's going to ensure that you get the same speed both ways. 
And at the same time, it also ensures that you get the same force uh, in both directions. So advancing and return are identical with both regards to force and speed. And those are usually shown like this. So again, you can see the, the symbols, they are just basic drawings of how, how this would look. Uh, so it's usually very easy to read the symbols for these. It's a bit more difficult when you get onto the valves and uh, motors and pumps because they are a bit more specialized symbols. But for pistons, they are usually very, very easy to, to, to learn how they look. Then we have uh, this one, which is uh, one with cushioning. That was actually the kind that they were creating. So we're going to get more into the end cushioning afterwards. But what you can see here is that the piston rod is slightly thicker uh, when it's close to the uh, piston than the rest of the piston rod. And then you actually have an opening here uh, which is a bit wider than the rest of the guide, which can fit this thicker part of the piston rod, which means that uh, as it's returning, you are basically restricting uh, the, uh, the area of um, uh, the volume where the fluid can flow through. So you're basically forcing it uh, into a smaller area so that you are get less flow, and that way you are basically uh, cushioning it. But we're going to look more into that uh, later on. So cylinder with end position cushioning. You can have cushioning in both ends, just so you know. And it's for reducing the speed of large loads and avoiding hard impacts. Like with, uh, with the forklift, if you don't have end cushioning there, you're going to get like large jerks. And if you have something just resting on top of the forks, if you get jerks, it's going to start jumping, and you really don't want that if it's something heavy that can fall off or, or something. If it's a bit unstable and you're just going to slightly move it, then uh, you really don't want any jerks to happen. So th they are always uh, equipped with, with uh, end position cushioning. And they are usually shown like this, which just basically means that you have a variable speed so that you can regulate the speed a bit. You can't manually regulate the speed in other ways than just allowing less fluid flow. So that if you have a proportional cylinder where you can actually, uh, the more you open your cylinder, then the more flow you are going to get. Uh, that's a way where you can manually end cushion it because then you can give it full flow as it's moving. And then as it's closing in on the end, you're going to just ease out on the on the flow. But this one is, is uh, basically designed to avoid this. <clears throat> then you have the telescopic ones. We also looked at those with the, uh, with the um, single acting cylinders because they, they, they exist as single acting ones also. The, the difference here is that we have this uh, chamber side on, on the piston rod side so we can actually pull it back uh, with the, uh, we, we can both push it out and pull it back when it's a, when it's a double acting telescopic one. And of course, like with the single acting cylinders, it allows for much larger strokes, so you can have a very long cylinder when you are working with this. And those are the symbols, which are fairly easy to, to read uh, if you know what you're looking at. Then you have a pressure booster. So this one is to increase pressure in a system which basically means that if you apply pressure on this side, you get pressure on, uh, onto uh, a fairly large surface area, so you get a lot of force. The force is transferred directly onto this side where you have a smaller surface area, so that when you are transferring uh, or calculating it backwards from force and back to pressure, you will see that uh, the pressure will get a lot larger because you have less area, so of course, if the, if the area is smaller, then the pressure has to be larger in order for the, the force to remain the same. So this is one of those great ways of, uh, of creating, creating a lot of force with, uh, for an example, uh, a hydraulic jack for, for a vehicle where you are pumping with your hand. You wouldn't really believe that you could lift one and a half tons with just uh, pumping your hand like this, and it's not really all that heavy when you're doing it. And that's because they are using the pressure boosting principle when they are, are uh, creating those. 
And it also has a fairly, fairly simple um, symbol to, to read. Then we have the tandem cylinder. <coughs> and these are, if we are restricted on space uh, diametrically, so that we, have, we only have this amount of space to work on, but according to our calculations, in order to get the correct amount of force, we should have a diameter that's this much. Then it's actually possible to create a, a long piston rod that goes through the uh, entire cylinder, and then you can have several pistons that are closed off. So basically here you have one piston with a piston chamber and a piston rod chamber, and then you have a complete sectioning off here, and then you have another piston with a piston rod uh, with a piston chamber and a piston rod. Uh, basically, it's a piston rod chamber on both sides for that one, but you can, w what you end up with getting is adding extra uh, surface area, because now you suddenly have a full piston and uh, a piston minus a piston rod to, to, to um, put all of your pressure across. So that you get the, the combined area of these two pistons is larger than what you would get with just one. So it's a, it's a nice way of keeping something fairly slim and yet getting the correct amount of force for it. <coughs> and it also has a fairly, fairly okay uh, symbol to, to read. Um, I think actually we're going to do a break before we do these uses. So we'll do a 15 minute break and uh, because then we can do the entire slide before, after the break.
Okay, so <clears throat> I just think it's uh, worth to mention that uh, these cylinders, you, you can use them directly in subsea, uh, subsea designs if you want to. The only thing that I would highly advise if you're uh, designing a hydraulic system for use subsea and you're going to use cylinders, make sure that you are buying stainless steel cylinders. Just so that don't buy regular steel cylinders that have been painted like the ones we saw in the clip. Uh, because uh, no matter how much you paint the outside of it, uh, the piston rod is go not going to have any paint on it. So the piston rod is going to be exposed to, to the seawater and it's going to corrode uh, if nothing else does. So that the best thing is to, is to just have the entire uh, one uh, created with, uh, with uh, stainless steel. So usually, <coughs> uh, usually that's a cheaper option than buying the ones that have been sort of specially made for subsea. The ones, s some of the companies creating cylinders actually have their own subsea section where they are uh, selling custom-made subsea cylinders. But they are often quite a lot more expensive and the only difference really is that they're using a little bit different seals and maybe they have a few extra seals so they might have uh, two seals instead of one there just to uh, avoid be completely sure that they avoid seawater penetration uh, <coughs> uh, it is also uh, it has also to do with reliability uh, with using two seals instead of one because then you have a double barrier so that if one of the seals should break for an example if the if the outer seal gets uh, destroyed by contamination that gets past the scraper ring, then, uh, then the, you still have uh, a seal further in that's going to, that's going to keep, it, uh, keep it clean and sealed off. So <coughs> uh, these cylinders, basically they will have uh, a slightly longer lifetime or if not a lifetime, then at least uh, they can have longer servicing intervals. But usually when you're using cylinders uh, for subsea products, it is often products that are going to be, they're just going to be submerged for the duration of the operation and then they're pulled back up again. So having a regular cylinder that's just made from stainless steel is not a problem because then you can do, do you have plenty of options for doing servicing uh, on the cylinders. And if the cylinder is going to cost 1.5, to two times as much uh, as the stainless steel cylinder, then is it really worth it going for the subsea cylinder or could you just use the stainless steel one and have uh, more, more frequent servicing intervals on it? So it's sort of a, a thing to, to, to look at when, when you're doing it, but, but definitely not use a regular cylinder when, when you're using it subsea. If, if it's just going down there and it's going to be operated once and then coming back up again, maybe you could use a regular cylinder, especially if you, you know that you're going to service it afterwards. Uh, then maybe, but uh, usually go for, for the stainless ones. They aren't really all that much different because the machining process and everything is the same. The only difference is that the stainless steel material is slightly more expensive than the regular steel. So that's, going, that's basically the difference in, in cost for those. But other than that, it's usually not necessary to, to, um, to do anything uh, with regards to the seals. So you don't need stronger seals or anything because uh, when you're using uh, a hydraulic system subsea, you will have the one that we've talked about before with the compensator, which is basically a cylinder uh, which would be open in one end to, to the seawater so that it's getting, it's getting pushed in by the seawater and then it's adding pressure to your entire hydraulic system. So that will be your, that will be your ground level, basically. Of your, uh, so if you're down at, at uh, 3,000 meters, so, so that you've got 300 bars approximately of pressure uh, f from, from the uh, hydrostatic pressure of the water, then it's going to push on your compensator and it's going to create 300 bars of pressure in your entire system, including your tank. So that your baseline is going to be 300 bars, 
and then your operating pressure is going to be above 300 bars. So if your operating pressure was supposed to be 200 bars uh, on land, it's going to actually be uh, 500 bars in this system. But since you have 300 bars surrounding it everywhere, it's the differential pressure is still just 200 bars. So the system doesn't really need to be uh, be designed to, to cope with 500 bars. You can have a 200 bar system and just compensate it so, so that it's, it's sort of equalizing each other all the way. It's a bit different when we start talking about hydraulic motors on Friday uh, because uh, there you get, uh, you have usually some areas where you don't have hydraulic pressure. So, so you, because there we talked about leakage oil uh, in the pumps that you will always get leakage oil. You get the same thing because a motor is just the same as a pump. You know, it's only going the other way around. You are rotating the axles. Uh, you are making the axles rotate by pushing fluid flow through it instead of rotating the axles in order to push fluid. <coughs> so you will still get this leakage oil, and that, that means that you will have some compartments where you can have more or less atmospheric pressure inside it. So, so that's, uh, that's a bit different, but I'm going to, uh, I have a section on it uh, for Friday uh, when we're looking at the hydraulic motors. But for cylinders, you don't really have that problem because you're going to use the, the vent screws and you're going to bleed off air, uh, as we're going to look at uh, in a bit. So, so you're going to make sure that there are no gas trapped inside your cylinder, which means that as long as you're using a compensator on your subsea system, you will have uh, you will have no differential pressure unless you are pushing on it uh, unless you are creating differential pressure so that it's going to be more or less the same as having it uh, having it uh, up here in the air so now we're going to look at uses <coughs> so they often uh, double acting cylinders often used in machine tools uh, often for using as feed motion, both for tools themselves and also to move work pieces within, uh, uh, within uh, uh, machining components. I know that um, if we're looking at uh, machining uh, benches, the, the computerized ones, the CNC machining uh, benches, where they might have, uh, they might have uh, quite a lot going on in, in one bench, they usually don't use a cylinder for the feed motion because they prefer to use a, uh, a threaded rod because then they can rotate the rod and they can decide exactly how many degrees of rotation they're going to have on it and then they know exactly how many millimeters uh, the workpiece has moved. While as if you're using a cylinder, it can be a bit more tricky getting it to stop in exactly uh, the correct position. So that for, for, for these very fine machine uh, tools, the CNC's and stuff, they usually don't use cylinders, but, uh, but for more coarse work. So uh, if you're uh, using a cutting machine, for example, some of the cutting machines use, use feed cylinders uh, in order to do it. Um, sometimes <coughs> if you have a huge saw, that's going to be, uh, you, you need to feed it forwards in order to cut into uh, a large tree or something. So, so if you've seen these huge machines that they use when they are uh, deforesting uh, forest areas, when they're cutting down a lot of trees and stuff, they usually use a lot of uh, hydraulic cylinders for it. And both to, both to clamp down on the, uh, on the trees, but also to move their, their saw blades back and forth and when they're cutting into the tree. So I think if you are getting the same uh, project from Runal, which the Norwegian students usually do, uh, you're actually going to create a saw that is going to clamp onto something, and then you're going to push the, uh, have a cylinder push the, uh, push the um, saw blade uh, back and forth. So I'm, uh, I'm not quite sure if he's uh, thinking about doing another project, but I know the Norwegian students did that uh, this spring uh, when they had it. So. Uh, might be that you are getting the same project. I'm not quite sure how he's going to do it. Um, <coughs> because uh, 
I basically don't have time to involve myself in it. Uh, so Runal is doing both the project and the lab. Uh, he has the responsibility for both uh, in this course. So I would have liked to have everything, <laughs> but I don't have time. Uh, CNC tools, so, so those are the, uh, when you are machining, so in, in a lathe or a milling machine, when you're machining them, uh, uh, you've probably seen the ones we have out here, or um, oh, you, you, were, uh, you had your lab at, uh, at Haugaland, uh, Vidalgona, so, so you had your uh, um, machining lab there. You also had welding there, didn't you? So you welded. Uh, so so the, the machining parts is that what the, what the pupils there learn, the, the uh, 17 year olds, 16, 17 year olds that uh, go to that school, what they learn, uh, how they learn to mill and uh, lathe, they learn it in manual machines. So they are, uh, they are, ro they are rotating by hand these, uh, these threaded rods that are moving the work pieces and everything. So they are doing everything by hand and they have uh, measuring tools, so they are measuring the distances and everything. But this can all be done computerized. So it can all be controlled by a computer where the computer is basically has uh, an XYZ coordinate system and it knows exactly where the workpiece is and it knows exactly where the tip of the uh, cutting tool is so that it knows when if I place the uh, workpiece here and I move the cutting tool here then I'm going to make this exact cut. So it's usually more accurate than, than doing it by hand. So uh, if you have a really, really uh, skilled worker doing it, they can do a pretty amazing job by hand. But like... Um, uh, like aluminium uh, rims for cars, those are usually made in CNC machines. And then you can have these completely crazy designs on them. So, so they're, they're just milled completely by a machine. So they've just loaded in uh, the 3D model from, from their CAD uh, program. And then the machine just goes from that and it sort of creates a path uh, where it's going to move the tool and cut shows, uh, shows the worker where it's going to cut and then the worker just looks over what the computer is showing him and sometimes he can just press OK, go and other times he has to look at it and say oh, that's going to be a problem putting that path there so I'm going to have to move it just a little bit and then he fixes it and then he presses OK and then it starts going. So, so those are the CNC machines and they can, they can be really amazing which is also why <coughs> usually in the CAD stuff I often use, if I'm not quite sure what tolerance to put, I just put a medium tolerance on stuff. Because usually, if things are being machined in a CNC machine, they're going to, it's going to be more or less spot on. It's going to be usually within the fine tolerances. So, so when they're running the machine, it's, unless they're doing a sloppy job, it's going to be very good tolerances on it. So that it's, uh, if you're not quite sure and it's not that important, you can just put a medium one on and you can feel pretty sure that the end product is going to be better than a medium tolerance. So it's a, it's a nice way of uh, being assured that you're going to get what you need from it. Uh, yeah, that was uh, the feed motion for tools and workpieces. Great example is for, for, the, uh, for the lumber uh, industry when, when they are cutting down trees and everything. And, and also for the sawmills when they are uh, moving uh, moving uh, huge logs and they are cutting them up into, uh, into regular wood, uh, woodwork. <laughs> so also we have the, the clamping parts, which also goes into this uh, lumber uh, industry. And cutting motion at planing, shaping and reaming machines, which basically means just like uh, you can have a circular saw run by hydraulics, you can have, uh, have uh, uh, and then have the saw itself being moved by, by, the, uh, by the cylinder. But you can also have regular saw, a saw that you have to move back and forth. It's not a circular saw. So you can have just cylinders moving it back and forth and sawing through it. Like for an example, if you have, just to do an example off the top of my head, if, if you have one of these huge, huge redwood trees that are, have a, an enormous diameter, if you're going to cut that along its length, you're not going to have a circular saw blade that's going to be big enough because then the circular saw blade, the radius of the circular saw blade has to be greater than the diameter of the tree. So that's going to be just uh, amazingly huge. So instead you have these, uh, as they did uh, back, back in the day when they were one guy 
on top of the tree and one guy underneath the tree and they were just pulling the saw blade up and down, up and down. Just You can do that by using using uh, uh, cylinders instead. So you don't have two guys sweating their uh, backs off by, <laughs> by working there. So that's uh, one of the other ways is, uh, you can use them. And also motion at presses. So when you have, uh, have uh, casting presses and stuff like that, you need to press something together and keep it there for a while. Then you can use cylinders to mm, do that. <coughs> and again, die casting and injection molding machines. And there are uh, loads of other uses within machine tools for them. In uh, transport equipment and hoists, so basically cranes and stuff like that, you have for uh, tilting, lifting, and swiveling for dumpers and forklifts, and every, all of the motions that are being done and in dump trucks and uh, forklifts and all kinds of, of uh, equipment like that is usually done by double acting cylinders. And then you have mobile equipment. So excavators, usually always, always uh, double acting cylinders. If you look at really old excavators, they might have these actually steel wires going through sheaves and everything. Everything is going back to the engine so that it's actually pulling on steel wires instead of pushing and pulling with, uh, with um, hydraulic cylinders. That's, uh, th those are quite, quite fun to look at when they are operating them because you just think that w what happens if one wire <laughs> goes <laughs> and then it's going to, <laughs> everything is going uh, uh, haywire then. So front end loaders, often they use them. Tractors use a lot of cylinders uh, for almost anything they do in the, uh, in the agricultural uh, industry. And uh, high lift fork trucks also use them. They often have uh, telescopic cylinders uh, in order to, to lift them uh, high enough. So uh, I've actually worked a lot, uh, quite a lot in warehouses and stuff. And uh, the tallest fork trucks that I've driven, uh, the ones that could lift the highest, that was um, uh, 11 stories of pallets. So one pallet story is about hip height. So 11 of these on top of each other. And then you could just run your forklift all the way up and you really had to stretch to see where you were going and then you could drive the forks into the pallet and lift it off. So that's uh, really tall. So you have these large warehouses where you can basically store things all the way from the floor and to the ceiling. So it's, you get a lot of, uh, a lot of money for your area there. <laughs> Cement mixers, they use a lot of uh, cylinders when they're working. <coughs> Especially like the the, um, the large trucks where they can really extend these cranes with cement so that they can dump it. For example, you can have the cement truck on one side of a house and then you can extend this across the house and dump it on the other side. So the, those are operated by hydraulic cylinders, which is really cool. And just think about the load that that's going to get because it's usually a pipe that's around this diameter that they're sending the, the cement through and they have to do it with force in order to get it across the house and everything. So, and cement is pretty pretty heavy, especially when it's wet. So it's even heavier than when it's uh, dried. So, so you're going to put this along this uh, across the house basically. So you need to have uh, really really strong equipment to do that. Airplanes. We've talked about the airplanes earlier with, with regards to hydraulics. So you, you have the uh, lifting, tilting, and swiveling. Uh, both for the landing gear and for the rudders and everything, uh, so it's uh, they use quite a lot. But as we as we've uh, talked about earlier, also with the airplanes, they usually have uh, very high sensitivity to contamination because often the cylinders are very very finely tuned, so so they don't they don't really have room for much uh, much size on their contamination particles. So they need they need uh, special filtering on theirs. Ships use it a lot, so for the rudder motions, the propeller pitch adjustment, basically uh, changing the, the way the propeller is uh, placed. A propeller can be pretty huge, so you need a lot of force to do that. And other stuff they use. They, they use a lot of hydraulic cylinders uh, on board of a ship, opening and closing hatches and doors and bulkheads and everything, so it's uh, qu quite a lot of hydraulic use on a ship. I have a, actually a mate of mine is working for, uh, for a company named Carme uh, uh, Vinch, uh, which is uh, based almost where I live. 
and uh, he's an automation engineer, but he works a lot with hydraulics. So they, are, uh, they, they create a lot of uh, winches and cranes that are uh, hydraulically operated. So um, I'm not sure, has uh, Torbjörn uh, told you about uh, you're having a visit to Kårstø uh, during this semester? So because you're supposed to have a visit later on in the semester, he's, he, he's doing the stuff with Kårstø, but I've also tried to get, uh, uh, I'm also working with getting an appointment with one of the uh, yeah. tugboats that are out there. So then you can actually get a, after you've been inside the cost processing plant and seen that, you get to go to the tugboat and you get to see on deck all of the, the hydraulic stuff that they have, the winches and stuff like that. You're going to get up on the bridge and look there and then uh, down into the machine room, I think, to also to look at stuff. So I think that's going to be pretty, uh, pretty interesting for you uh, if we get that happening. I can't, I can't guarantee it because I know that they sometimes have to, there are two tugboats there. Usually one is always present in the harbor, so, so hopefully uh, it is there, but every once in a while something happens where both of them have to, have to leave to, uh, to, to help a ship that has some trouble out in the, in the fjord there or something. So we, we might end up not being able to do that part anyway, but, but uh, hopefully we will get it done. So uh, I'm, uh, I think that's going to be, I won't be able to join you on that one because I have uh, lectures with the Norwegian students here. So, but uh, Runal is going to, to join you. So it's going to be a, be a nice one, I think. <coughs> so end position cushioning. We've already looked a bit at it. And it's used to decelerate the high stroke speeds that you can get. So basically just make sure that you don't get a sudden stop at the end. So you avoid those hard impacts, which, like I said, on a forklift, you can end up with your entire load just jumping up and down, uh, and that's not good at all. And usually, if you have a cylinder speed where your velocity is less than 0 0.1 meters per second, so it's not really going all that fast, then you don't need a cushioning uh, system because it's going to, it's going to uh, go, uh, go pretty well uh, without it. It's not going to get this jerking uh, motion. But then if you have uh, a velocity that's uh, up to 0 0.3 meters per second, then you're going to need cushioning uh, at the endpoints of your, of your uh, cylinder. And then if you have a velocity that's even greater than that, then you're going to need special systems that are going to cushion it. Then it's not enough to just have these machined parts that automatically uh, make sure that it's going to be, be cushioned but you're also going to need uh, more um, control on your flow. So you would probably need to have sensors connected to the cylinder, uh, which senses the exact position of the cylinder and then tells it when it's reaching the end position, it tells the valves to start uh, choking down on the, uh, on the fluid flow so that it doesn't go all that fast. So that it basically slows down to less than 0 0.3 and then the regular cushioning system uh, kicks in uh, at the end uh, position. So uh, th those are really special, but usually you don't have cylinders that operate at those speeds. That's going to be uh, very special systems that do that. I, I can't really think of any examples of it. The, the only thing that might be is like in production lines, uh, you saw some of the, uh, when we look at the oil filters, how they are uh, making those in the production lines, some of the movements there are pretty quick. Uh, and those are usually uh, hydraulic cylinders. Often they're not hydraulic either, they're, they're pneumatic, so they're using air instead. But uh, it might be something like that, but usually then if you have those speeds, it's not really necessary to have cushioning because you're just pushing something off. So you're, it's moving on the conveyor belt and then you're just pushing it off. Uh, so you really don't need to have an end position uh, cushioning. So it, I can't really, uh, I can't really uh, come up with a good example of where this would be necessary, but just try to remember 0 0.3 meters per second. That's like a, a golden rule. Try to, uh, if you have something that's going moving faster than that, have a higher stroke speed, then, then you really have to think about your system. <coughs> So this was the, a larger version of the one we saw in the table earlier with the end position cushioning. And here we have a flow control 
screw. And we have the cushioning shafts, so the parts that are, are cushioning the, uh, uh, making sure that you have less area working. And here we also have flow control screw on that side. Uh, and then we have the non-return valves down here. So th those are the regular check valves, ball valves. So they allow, <coughs> in this case, if we are pushing in fluid here, it will enter this area and start pushing at this piston, but it will also flow past the check valve because the, uh, the spring load is there and the ball is here. So it's going to push on the ball and it's going to compress the spring load and then it's just going to go all the way in here. So it's going to get instant access to the entire piston. The same happens on this side. You start pushing fluid in here, it's going to compress the spring of the ball valve and it gets instant access to all of the uh, piston ring area there. But when it's going back, so when we are pushing in here and the uh, piston is being uh, sent back into its starting position, the hydraulic fluid is going to go in here, but it's going to press the, the ball inside the check valve. It's going to press it against the edge there. So it, that completely seals it off. So there is going to be no flow past here. So it's just going to push in here and just stop there. And that means as soon as this part this cushioning shaft enters this part of the cylinder, it blocks off flow past here. So it blocks off flow going directly in here. Then uh, you, you suddenly have quite a lot less flow because nothing can enter in here, nothing can enter this way. All of your flow has to go through this small channel and into, into the outer ring here, which is connected to the, the flow port there. And then you have this flow control screw. If you screw this one in here, you're going to more and more choke off this area. So it's b it basically acts as a choke valve so that you can really choke off the flow here, making sure that as soon as the cushioning shaft enters this part of the cylinder, then you, are, you basically have, can have full choke on this system. So you're really restricting the flow, which means that the rest of the volume of hydraulic fluid that is in here, it all has to pass through this small point and that's going to, to uh, uh, create, uh, uh, create a lot of uh, problems there because you can't keep the same, uh, same flow then you're going to, to, to get a lot less flow going through it because your cross-sectional area is way less and your velocity basically stays the same. So your velocity isn't going to change that much. So your, your entire flow is going to be very restricted. The same happens on this side. As soon as this thicker part of the piston rod enters this area down here, then all of the fluid flow can only go through here and into the, uh, past the flow control screw. So you get the same kind of throttling uh, effect there. Which is, of course, great unless you are uh, actually getting really, uh, really high speeds on this one. So past 0 0.3 meters per second, then you could really easily get cavitation around that throttle point. So, so that, that's one of the reasons why past 0 0.3 you would, you would need uh, special systems because then you have to slow it down before, before it enters the, uh, the uh, mechanical end positioning uh, cushion. <coughs> yeah, basically what I've just told. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, that was what I did. <laughs> so <clears throat> the seals, we know we have seals different places here. We have seals between the piston chambers. We also have seals on the, uh, on the uh, ends of the, of the cylinder and everything. So the seals are there to to prevent leakages. Because if we get a leakage, we're going to get a pressure drop. <clears throat> and we have static seals, which are placed between non-moving parts. So between the cylinder barrel and the end cap and the cylinder bottom. So th those are static seals. Uh, those are especially created to just stay in one position, nothing is going to slide past them or anything like that. So, so they're just in there. Usually it's 
it's an O-ring of some kind. So O-rings for the cylinder housing. Uh, yeah, for, for the tank cover, you would just use a, a flat a flat seal. So you would have uh, maybe some kind of rubber or something that was shaped like the the rim of the tank, and then place it on top of the rim. And then when you put your cover on top, then that's going to create a, a seal around it. And then you have the dynamic seals, which are for moving parts. So that's between uh, the piston, uh, um, yeah, piston and piston rod seals. So, so those are between, between for the piston, it's between the seal and the barrel and the piston itself, because the piston is going to move along the the inside of the seal and the barrel. So they need it needs a different kind of seal in order to to maintain uh, no leakage there. And the same goes for the piston rod as it's moving through the uh, the um, this uh, positioning ring. Uh, at the at the end of the uh, cylinder, and also the shaft seals uh, for rotating devices. So if you have a hydraulic motor, the same goes there. You will need a special seal uh, on the rotor for it, because that's going to it's going to go around and around, and you don't want hydraulic fluids to to uh, escape for, from the motor, because then you will have much leakage. You will have some leakage, which we are going to look into on Friday, but you want to. You, you don't want it to sort of be completely flowing through, through there, so you need to you need to stop most of it. And it is recommended that we we stay at maximum 0 0.2 meters per second when we have uh, moving parts. And I think that's a very a very fair one to to have. It's, it it doesn't sound like much 0 0.2 meters per second, but it is actually quite. Uh, quite fair speed when it's when we're talking about a cylinder moving. So, and, but it of course it depends on the operating conditions, the types of seals, types of seals we have, and which materials we are working with. So, different kinds of, uh, of of materials might mean that we need to have less speed, basically than 0 0.2, and also the operating conditions have quite a lot to say. So, so the pressures we have and uh, everything like that. So. And <clears throat> the type of seal and the material it is made of is very dependent on the pressure, of course, but it also is dependent on temperature, the speed, the diameter, and what fluid it is, actually, because if you have these flame retardant fluids, some of them have chemicals in them, and those chemicals can degrade certain kinds of rubber uh, and, uh, and uh, O-ring materials like that, so uh, then you're going to have a very short lifetime of, of your seal, so you have to very often uh, dismantle your entire uh, cylinder and then put it back together again, which is not a, a good thing to do too often. If you have a, a it's going to cause downtime in, in your uh, downtime in your production system, so that will have a lot to say. And the fluid actually has especially a lot to say in a subsea well. So, so in in the production flow system in a subsea well. There you can have uh, a lot of different uh, stuff that's going to affect the seals. So there you have to be really sure about what seal you're going to use. <coughs> Not that that had something to do specifically with the hydraulic system, but I just thought I would mention it. <laughs> it's, the, it's the same principle for sealing in a hydraulic well as it is for, for a, uh, in a oil well as it is for a hydraulic system. You still want it to have no leakage uh, and everything. So. So different types of seals at the piston. Uh, you can have a slip ring seal, uh, and that's especially for uh, low pressure and speed. So you have a a pressure ring, uh, and then you have no, you have the pressure rings. You have the sealing ring, the sealing ring, which is that one, and then the backup ring there. So <coughs> you have different different uh, parts of the ring, uh, uh, different parts of sealing uh, happening in here. Usually the the part here is, is uh, a flexible material so that it's going to flex. It's going to, if you get pressure coming past here into this part, it's going to deform this one. Basically, instead of being uh, letting it be circular, it's going to end up being oval. So it's going to be pushed in this direction, becoming an oval. And as it 
gets squeezed in this direction, it extends in that direction and it pushes on this ring so that it's going to seal completely. <coughs> then we have V-shaped seals. Those are the ones I talked about earlier, where they are, they are basically shaped so that they are going to be deformed and, and uh, just going to open up more like a flower uh, so that they're going to be pushed into the edges by the pressure. And those also have three parts. And it says they're rugged operation, but basically uh, if you have greater speeds and greater pressures, you want these because they are going to create a tighter seal. They are also going to create a bit more friction than this solution so that you, you will get a bit more resistance in your system. It's not much, but it, it might have something, uh, some effect. So. <clears throat> and then the seals at the piston rod is just a regular slip ring with a wiper. That's the one that keeps the rod clean before it enters into the cylinder again. And then you can have V-shaped seals, and then uh, you have a wiper connected to it. Again, this is for the this is for the rugged parts, and this is for the uh, low speed, low pressure. So with with low speed and low pressure, you actually only need that ring at the end there. That that will be enough to to. Um, you have this ring here also, I think. Yeah, this part here also uh, keeps it tight. But as you can see here, you have lots of these V-shape uh, parts that are going to to be pushed open and uh, and uh, push against the uh, both against the uh, piston rod and against the barrel housing. <coughs> then you also have sealing elements that are made of PTF which is a kind of uh, polyester type. If you've, uh, every one of you have probably heard about Teflon. So you have a Teflon coating on your, on your frying pan and stuff. Uh, Teflon is PTFE. So it's, uh, it's quite, that, that's basically the most slippery substance that we uh, can manage to make. So you can't get anything that has a lower friction factor, uh, friction uh, coefficient of friction than, uh, than Teflon. Uh, and the P PTF is similar to it, uh, but it's still going to, uh, it's more, uh, it's more flexible basically, so, so it acts better as uh, a sealant in this case. <coughs> and it fits for high speeds and high pressures. And then it gets its, again, it gets the contact force uh, through O-rings, just like up here. So the O-ring is deformed and then it pushes on the, on the uh, PTF ring so that it pushes against the, in this case against the barrel and uh, here, uh, no, in this case against the piston rod and in this case against the barrel itself. So that's how it, how it uh, gets the force it needs to, to keep it, keep it in, uh, with no leakage. Now we're going to look at different mounting options for cylinders. So one of them is foot mounting. So then you basically have sort of uh, foot rests where you put your cylinder into it. The cylinder could be welded to, to the, uh, basically pre-welded to these footholds so that you know, you know the location from drawings of the footholds and you know the uh, hole of the diameter of the hole so that you can, in your design, uh, create uh, mating holes so that you can just screw it in. Uh, some of them are also uh, open so that you basically strap the cylinder into place, but those are meant for very low pressures and stuff, so it's more of for the pneumatic cylinders, which are basically more ma made for high speeds and very low, pr uh, low forces. You have, have a swivel mounting, uh, where you basically have a, a look, looks more like a... Um, a, a shackle point almost at the end. So you have a, a, a thin plate that is welded to the bottom of the cylinder. It extends out and it has uh, a hole going through it. So then you can put a, a shaft or uh, just a bolt through it or anything and then you can put it into place. Usually you have some kind of shaft because you want a, a very fine tolerance there. You don't want it to be very loose so that it can jump back and forth as the cylinder is moving. So you want it to be a very tight fit there. Uh, but it's still going to be uh, able to rotate so that this end of the cylinder 
it can rotate uh, around uh, this center line here. So you could basically rotate it outwards like this or inwards or anything. Which is very good like in a, in a forklift when you are, uh, as we saw in, in the movie, when it was lifting the forks, just tilting them backwards. Then all of the framework is also moving so that the, this part of the cylinder is stuck to the framework. But this end, which is stuck to the truck itself, it has to be able to, to swivel so that as the framework is moving, it also has to be able to, to rotate so that it doesn't get bent out of shape while it's doing, trying to do this. <clears throat> then you also have flange mountings, uh, where you basically just have a flange around the, uh, one of the ends of your cylinder and you just bolt it in wherever it's going to go. Uh, a flange like this, I would think you probably have uh, a hole cut into wherever you're going to use it. You push the entire cylinder in and then you bolt it from this side, bolt it to, to the structure, so that basically it's only the piston rod that's going to protrude from, uh, from the structure. But there are, uh, you, you can also have a flange in this end, so there are many options there. And then you have another swiveling uh, type of mount, which is basically a uh, combination of the foot mounting and the swivel mount. So instead of having this uh, hole where you can put a shaft through at the end of the cylinder, you have these shafts sticking out of the cylinder at the middle so that it can actually rotate in the middle instead. So it will, it will rotate along the axis of these, these two uh, shaft ends that are sticking out. <coughs> then it's, it's called exhaust, but this is the, uh, how we bleed off uh, air uh, from the system. And it is to achieve jerk-free motions. Uh, we have to have it completely free of air uh, before doing that. And this is especially important if you are putting your system subsea. You can't have any air in your system as you're putting it subsea. Because then as the compensator is uh, creating the pressure, uh, equalizing the pressure, get down to 3,000 meters, 300 bars, then you are suddenly going to have air bubbles that are very, very tiny, but they are at 300 bars in there. And they can burst. They can create a lot of havoc uh, there. If something happens, if you get a leak or something, they're going to just explode out uh, from the system. So you really don't want to have uh, air bubbles in, in a subsea system, uh, even more than in, in a regular uh, hydraulic system. The good thing is that the air bubbles, they will collect at the highest point within a system. Of course, they will flow to the top, basically. And as you are running the system, they will all gather at the highest point in the system itself. Uh, as you're moving the fluid around inside the system, they will gather at different altitudes to begin with. But then if you run the system for a little while, everything should be at the very highest point of the system. And then you usually they have a bleed screw. And that is often why the cylinder has a bleed screw on each end, basically so that almost no matter how you are tilting or moving your, or your cylinder, you can get to, to the top point of it. <coughs> and usually the, the bleed screws can look in uh, many different ways. The function is that you have, you have a port where you screw it into, and then you have a room for hydraulic fluid to escape out of it, and so that when you open it, uh, it's going not to have contact with the with the edge here anymore, and then the uh, air can escape out. And basically what you do is that you just unscrew it. There is a slight pressure in the system, so you unscrew it, the air is going to escape, and then suddenly you're going to get oil out from it, and then you can just close it off again. So as soon as you have oil without any sputtering or anything, you have just a constant stream of oil, then you know that there is no more air left in the system. But if it's still sputtering, there are still air bubbles in there, so that you have to wait until you get a, a, constant, a continuous flow of hydraulic fluid. Yeah, the cylinders have bleed screws at both ends usually. Um, you can also, if you depressurize your system, uh, you can also have uh, connect pressure gauges to these ports so that you can get direct pressure reading uh, from uh, both of the chambers in the piston. So, and then you... Uh, I think uh, actually some of the pressure gauges are fitted with a bleed screw so that you get the, uh, the dual uh, component so that you can bleed the system 
open, and then afterwards it just acts as a regular a pressure gauge, so, so that you you can read off the pressure. We have some characteristic data for it. We need to know the load. We need to know the required pressure. And we uh, have to calculate the piston diameter. <coughs> we also need to know the hydraulic mechanical efficiency of the system. Uh, ba basically, how, how many percent of the hydraulic energy are you going to be able to convert into mechanical energy? Usually, this just means that you need to subtract the uh, friction uh, from, uh, from the system. So any mechanical friction inside the system has to be taken into account, basically. So uh, th this is often a very high one, so 98, 99% is usually, uh, it's usually a very high hi hydraulic mechanical efficiency. And it depends on the surface roughness of the cylinder barrel and the piston rod and of course the seal system, so how much friction you are getting when you are moving this. So the more, uh, more accurate the cylinder has uh, been made, then the better this uh, friction is going to be, or the, the lower this friction is going to be. So usually within a range of 85 to 95, I've, this is what the book says, uh, I would more say 90 to 98, that's what I'm used to seeing when I'm looking at data sheets. So but uh, at least if you're uh, having a maximum of 95, you're not, you're not uh, far off in what it's going to be. And with an increase of pressure, you're going to get an uh, increased efficiency. So that at a low pressure, you're, not go you're going to get actually a higher effect from your friction than if you are using a high pressure. So the higher the pressure you have, the less, uh, the less effect from the friction. And the way we calculate it is we still use uh, that the force is equal to pressure times area, but then we factor in the, the efficiency, so 0 0.95 for an example. So the load F, the pressure, and the um, hydraulic mechanical efficiency, and then we have the area. And if we need to calculate the piston diameter, we know what force we are going to, uh, to use, we know what pressure uh, we're going to use, and we know the, the efficiency. Then we can replace the area with this one and we can solve it for the diameter. So then we get this, this expression in order to get the diameter directly. But you also have to do volumetric efficiency, into, take that one into account, which just looks at leakage uh, across your seals. And so long as the seals are intact on the piston, this one is going to be 100%. So it's only if you have a damaged seal that uh, there is actually going to be leakage between, between the chambers. It's different in a, in a motor, there you're going to have leakage anyway. <coughs> so I think uh, we're actually going to stop there. I'll do the last few slides. I think there are only two left. Uh, so I'll do those on Friday.